Um, and before I start, um, I'd just like to thank the Lord for his grace that he's given me and shown me and the mercy that he's shown me. And I really do say that in the bottom of my heart that I would not be standing here preaching if it were not for the Lord's grace and mercy uh, that he gives us so liberally. All right, if you have your Bibles here this morning, uh, turn to the book of Philemon, the best book in the whole Bible. Philemon, some call it, pronunciation is apparently Philemon. Um, you can turn there so long and I'll start with a, just a simple introduction, uh, just to lay the foundation and the groundwork of this epistle um, that Paul has written to Philemon. And as Pastor Carl was saying, just an excellent um, epistle just to ponder on the theme of forgiveness and how us as Christian born-again believers, how we ought to have what the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us in mind when we're dealing with others that have perhaps wronged us, or offended us, or trespassed against us. So before I read and before we start the introduction, just a quick word of prayer. So you buy ahead with me and you can just ask the Lord to be with us now. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you'll make the message clear and that you'll create soft hearts that might receive the message. Father, I give you all the glory and honor and praise worthy of your name. May you bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, so the title of this sermon is A Good Ending. And while I was studying the book of Philemon and preparing to preach on it, one of the things I noticed is that God is the expert at good endings. There's nobody who can do an ending like God. If you've watched a number of movies, you'll notice that a lot of movies, somebody just somewhere something went off track and the ending was terrible and you thought, wow, what a waste of time. Now, God, in his, uh, in his ultimate knowledge, his sovereign wisdom and will, has given us the scriptures that we know what the ending is going to look like. We know the beginning, we know the ending. And we thank the Lord that it didn't stop at Genesis 7 there at the flood. And we have a great and a blessed hope to look to. So that must always be on the forefront of our mind. And this epistle probably dated around AD 64. I'm not sure what that might mean to you, but there it is. Anno Domina, which is the year of our Lord 64. And uh, Onesimus, uh, which is the, the servant that's, that uh, Paul is writing of, actually means the name means profitable. So I thought that was quite funny because he had stolen from his master and ran off and then his name is profitable. So he wasn't very profitable. He was acting contrary to his own name. And he robbed his master, which is Philemon, and fled from Colossae to Rome. And there, by God's grace, Onesimus encountered Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, who shared with him the word of God, causing him to become a begotten son. Onesimus tells Paul that he has departed from his master, Philemon, and so Paul intercedes, seeking to reconcile the two parties together by this wonderful epistle which we have. So Paul instructs Onesimus to return to Colossae and to his master Philemon, not as a slave, but now as a dearly beloved brother. Onesimus takes leave from Paul and returns to Philemon furnished with this epistle, which we know is the word of God, as it's in our scripture. All right, so if you have your Bibles open, I'm just going to, I know it's a lot of verses, so I'm going to read through it quite quickly, um, and then we'll start. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apai and Archippus, fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech you, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receiving, that is, mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. 
Now, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he has wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I said. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be your spirit. Amen. Written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant. <clears throat> All right, so looking at Philemon, we're looking at the first three verses. And one thing I wanted you to notice there is Paul speaking of Philemon as a dearly beloved. Okay, a dearly beloved. So he loves Philemon and a fellow laborer and beloved Apaya and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And we read other places in the scripture that Archippus was a faithful minister, a faithful worker, a fellow laborer. And so that word fellow was the first thing that struck out for me. And I saw, and I went and looked in the dictionary, it was the Webster's 1828 dictionary. It means to tie or connect. And I thought, wow, that, that's really what it is. It's like we tie ourselves to a labor. We tie ourselves to another servant in Christ. We tie ourselves to a ministry, and there we serve. And so Philemon here referred to Paul as a fellow laborer. So that word again, fellow, that being tied and dearly beloved with the church in his house. So, of course, Philemon was active. Philemon was a believer that was bearing much fruit, and he had a church in his house. And so with that in mind, we see Paul starts this letter by acknowledging that. And, and, and I'm sure when Philemon read this, he also he thought, well, oh, that's my fellow laborer and dearly beloved. Yeah, this is the Apostle Paul that's writing these things about me. What a privilege and an honor to have that said about you. So from this introduction, we can already see that Paul has much good to say about Philemon. He recognized Philemon as very much a part of the ministry that is to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. There's a reference, I'm not going to go into that for the second time, but in Colossians 1, which is very Philemon and Colossians, you've got to kind of read those together to get a lot of these themes. But really, what I want us to focus on, and the point I want to draw here, is that you cannot do it alone. Okay, You need to be involved in fellowship. A good work is to serve the Lord in the manner or the ministry that he has called you to. If you do not know where the Lord would have you to serve, or you do not see an opportunity, in your local church, pray and diligently search the scriptures until the Lord reveals his will to you in this regard, or might well create an opportunity for you to start serving him. For I know the Lord would have each and every one of us to be a part of the ministry, either as a fellow laborer, a fellow soldier, a fellow prisoner, a fellow worker, a fellow helper. All of this tied in to the cause and the purpose of God. And that is to go out there and make disciples and to build the church, build the church. That's what the Lord Jesus wants us to do. We do this through fellowship. There's a scripture in Matthew 4, two or three are gathered together in my name. For sorry, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I just thought about this this morning, pondering on this point. Um, myself and Brother Daniel yesterday out on the streets and we were witnessing to a gentleman. Um, it was Adrian. Ed, Ed, Ed. And I had had a conversation with him prior, and, and because I was standing there, both myself and Dane, Dane asked him a question which I didn't ask. And that question led to an opportunity to share the gospel with him, which I believe was more effective. But the thing I realized there is that when there's more than just you involved in this ministry, when there's more than just your thoughts, your skills, your this and that, there comes a greater opportunity to bear more fruit for your account, but also for the person who's helping you. And so Dan mentioned something to him that struck up the, the opportunity to share the gospel with him. Unfortunately, he rejected it and he got up and walked away, but it gave us the opportunity to bear witness, to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel message of Christ. Um, if you will, just quickly, briefly, let's skip across to Colossians. 
the best book in the whole Bible, and then we can um, take it a verse there. I'm going to call every book the best book in the whole Bible. So <laughs> for that. Um, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, and I'm not going to read through it all uh, for the sake of time. I just want you to look at verse 9 to 11. I'm going to read there from verse 9 to 11. I'll just give you a moment to read through. And, and I do encourage you to turn and read the scriptures um, because it's the scriptures that um, impress these things upon our heart and, and help to plant the seed. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So a good work. Are we as believers, are we involved in a good work? We've got to ask ourselves that question. We've got to be serious about it. Are we involved in a good work? Are we building the Lord's church? Or God forbid, are we working against that? That's my first point that I'd like to make this morning. A good work. You cannot do it alone. You need the Lord's grace, but you also need the Lord's people that he brings into your life. And as I'm maturing and walking with the Lord, and I'm starting to realize this this morning, well, you cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. Being a Christian in isolation is a disaster waiting to happen. It really is. It really is. And you put away your Bible, you eventually put away, well, you put away fellowship, you put away your Bible, and before you know it, you'll cast off your faith and you'll make shipwreck. And we, we don't want that to happen. Um, all right, so let's move on, looking at a good report. So I'm going to look at verses 4 to 7. And I thank my God making mention of the always in my prayers. So your Paul's going to give a report. Of Onesimus, he's saying, I thank God when I hear about these things that, that are being mentioned of thee. So, and I also make mention of thee in my prayers. He says, Hearing of thy love, verse 5, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. And, and yet, yeah, I want you to really focus on this that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, that the way you are practicing that faith may become effective, producing the desired outcome by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Here we read in Colossians, being filled with the knowledge of his will. So here we see we need to acknowledge that the good that is within us is not, it's not our good. It's not our good. I just told you now, if we were to forsake fellowship with believers, if we close our Bibles, we would stop praying. I can assure you the fruits of the flesh your flesh will come running and screaming and rip out. And before you know it, you're living like the devil. And you will even forget that you were ever saved. And God forbid that would happen. And then you need to grant repentance, giving back to acknowledging of the truth. But here Paul saying to Philemon, acknowledge that every good thing which is in you, Philemon, is in Christ Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in Galatians 2.20. All right, man, I would just... Highlight two things here is that Paul thanks, and I've just said this now, but Philemon's love and faith, which Philemon has towards the Lord Jesus, but also towards all the saints. And Paul mentions in this prayer that the communication of Philemon's faith, as we said, may become effectual. That what does that word mean? Is, is the effect is producing the desired outcome that the, the saints will be refreshed, preached, teached, and warmed, and grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And looking at our own lives, our gracious Lord would have us to also obtain a good report. Can these things be said about us? Wow, when, when I hear of X's love, and, no, no, not X's, when I hear of Tyron's love and faith, and I see he's laboring as a fellow worker, he's obedient, he's willing to do more, do we have that report? And here, one of the most wonderful things, before Paul makes any requests, he first Praises, finally, well, not praises. He thanks God for what wonderful, good qualities he sees in Philemon, which he knows is in Christ Jesus. So he sees Philemon as being Christ-like, and he's thanking Philemon and thanking God for it. So our gracious Lord would have us to obtain a good report. So we need a good report. We need a good work, but we also need a good report after we've done this work. So our Savior, the Lord Jesus, has placed us with people in the church for that very purpose, to obtain a good report. 
And it's often very easy to demonstrate our love towards our Lord. But how about to his people, the saints? So then to make this love and faith effectual, which I've said now is producing the desired outcome, we need to acknowledge where the source of this goodness is in our lives. This goodness is obviously and most certainly in Christ Jesus who is in us. And it's not ourselves. Paul says, I know no good thing but I think. And that's a very important thing to remember. And when you're fighting with your flesh, you've got to realize that flesh is still alive. And that flesh still wants you to sin against God and go walk according to the flesh and not by the spirit of God. And letting flesh, it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, which is don't let it rule. You have a power, you have the spirit of God working in you. You can get that thing into submission and say, no flesh, we ain't doing it like that anymore. We're walking by the Spirit of God, we're denying ourselves, we're picking up our cross, we're waging this good warfare. Before I go on a tangent, let me stick to my notes, otherwise we're going to be here for a while. All right, so we need to obtain a good report through doing a good work. And um, we're going to be hopping a lot to Colossians, so I think I think maybe just uh, keep your, your third hand or whichever you have available there uh, in Colossians. Uh, and we look at verse, chapter 1, verse 25 to 27, thinking of this good report. Where have I made a minister according to the dispense? Sorry, I should give you a bit more time to get there. All right. Not many pages turning, so I guess we'll there. Where have I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which from generations but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. So that's the good report, that acknowledging that it's Christ in you. And this is a mystery that's revealed to saints. It's a knowledge from God that Paul received by revelation directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. This good thing in you is of God. It's not you, it's of God. You're not good. God is good. We know that. And uh, sometimes we, we might be, we might have a good report. We might be involved in a good work. And we start thinking it's us that are we the good ones. No. no. That's a very dangerous thing to start doing. It's acknowledging the Lord. Then these things come, the fruit of this work. Acknowledging it's the Lord's work. All right. Now, looking at really what I believe is the heart and soul of the message, or, or rather the epistle of Philemon. And this is a good intercessor you'll know between the verses 8 and 21 we see paul taking up this role as a mediator a reconciler if that's a word love for the wrongdoer in this case in essence and then imputation these are big biblical words put that on mine account which we're going to read in a moment paul saying put the wrong being of an essence put it on my account and this i believe truly is a picture of, of the gospel, the gospel message. And that's why I chose the three crosses there, the good intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we're going back to Philemon and we're going to look at verse 8. And I won't read through it all, but we'll just look at verse 8 and 9. And I just want you to see, uh, wherefore thou might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee. Now, enjoin, I don't know what words your Bibles have, but in, in my version, Enjoin means it's a little bit less than a direct command, but it is, it is an instruction given with authority. Now, Paul is obviously an apostle, so he does have that authority to command um, Philemon to accept back Onesimus just purely because he's commanded it. But he's not saying that. He's, he's rather trusting to show graciousness and be graceful and be a, a really good mediator in this case to try and reconcile these two parties that are at war with each other. So in verse 8 and verse, verse 8 to 9, Paul beseeches Philemon instead of enjoining him, which I've just said now is a bit of a higher instruction, uh, sorry, a bit of a lower instruction than command. Now, he beseeches Onesimus to receive, to receive Onesimus as himself, all right? Now, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, a beloved brother that has ministered to Paul and the saints. And now the same benefit can be for Philemon if you should receive Onesimus back willingly, not by necessity. For what Paul's saying is, here, Philemon, I want you to have the most benefit from this. I want this to grow you as a believer, as a saint. And I want you to do this by acknowledging 
this good work, acknowledging that, yes, you have a good report, but I want you to do this of your own volition, if you will. I want you to do this willingly. I don't want to have to force you to do this. And if you do it willingly, if you're obedient, and you do it willingly, then you will receive the benefit. And so much, it's always like that. It's, it's the blessing comes after the obedience. And it's something I'm constantly having to learn. <laughs> the Lord of Chastening, uh, for the Lord I'm with the Chastener, that around us that a lot. And it's always that obedience. The Lord is wanting the obedience. And here Paul is beseeching by him for that exact point. And then we go to verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bond. So Paul is in prison. Uh, Onesimus obviously met him in Rome, flee Palestine where he was supposed to be, and shot off to Rome, and said, well, I think I'm going to take what I've got and, you know, make a life for me and do a so-and-so and such and such and what have you. But that's not what the Lord would have, for he meant the man Paul, and he heard the gospel, and he was begotten. It's a lovely, lovely phrase, we're seeing it like that. It's like born again and begotten. And uh, moving further here, Paul's tender love. For, for his dearly beloved Philemon. So we're looking at verses, verses 10, 11 through to 16 here. And I'm not going to read them all through, but I'm just going to make a point here. But Paul's tender love, not only for his dearly beloved Philemon, but also for his son, Onesimus. She says, a son, brother, beloved, a begotten one. This is the love Paul has for a runaway servant turned thief. Onesimus, a profitable, a profitable uh, servant. who's not very profitable at all, really. I mean, if you think about it, he's stolen and ran off. That's, that's, that's a definitely not a profit. Um, so very, very unlike his name. No longer unprofitable, though. No longer despised or rejected, but rather accepted, given a new life, given a purpose and a good work, and accepted on account of another. On whose account? On Paul's account. That's what he's saying. He's saying, accept Onesimus. Sorry. Yes, as, accept Onesimus, as if you're accepting it. My report I have with you, let it be his report. A wonderful picture of the grace of God for sinners, giving them a new life through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A pattern is seen of this by the life of Onesimus, Philemon, and Paul through this epistle. We see that such a wonderful picture of our salvation. As we were on the run, you know, out there making trouble. And the Lord encountered us and we heard the gospel and we're born again, we're begotten, now our son. Somebody shared the gospel with us. We heard it, we responded, we believed it, placed our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And now we have a purpose. Now we have a need to do a good work. We have a need to have a good report. We have a need to do the things which God has purposed for us to do. And that, that should excite you and, and energize you and say, man, what is it the Lord wants me to do? There's a man by the name of Dr. Bob Jones Sr. He's very, very, very respected. Um, old timer, I can't remember, I think like in the 50s or something. But anyway, he said the most important thing for man to do is to find out what God's will is for his life and to do it. That's our most important thing. And we do that by studying the scriptures, by, by praying, by being involved in the good work, by obtaining a good report, and then the Lord will show us the way. And obviously through his word as well. My word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Finally, imputation, to impute. And he says here from verses 17 to 21, if he has wronged thee or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. And again, the heart of the person, a pattern of the gospel of Christ. And just to define that word for you, and I'll say it pretty slowly, imputation is the act of God, whereby he charges the sinner's sins to Jesus Christ. And whereby he charges the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the sinner. And that's the transaction that's happening. That's what's happening to Onesimus and Paul here. As Paul mediates this reconciliation, he's saying, whatever he owes you, put that on my account. And whatever good I've done to you, you take that. That's the exchange. And that's the heart of the gospel. God says, listen, your righteousness, that thing is filthy. That's not going to get you into heaven. That's your righteousness and the things you've done is going to get you nowhere. Unfortunately, the only place that you can look to is going down into the pits into hell. God says, don't, don't, don't do that. I have the perfect righteousness, and you can have it. This is the good news. You can have the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness, not your own. You can get rid of your own. You can trust in Christ's righteousness to a Savior. And really, this is what we're seeing. It's, it's such a wonderful pattern of what an effectual, uh, loving, 
for somebody who's done wrong, a love for a sinner, thief. But now look at Paul saying, man, I'm already in prison. I mean, what more do I need? All right, put his stuff on my account as well. Who knows what he stole? Maybe he stole quite a lot, you know? Maybe very valuable things. And Paul's saying, well, whatever he owes, I don't know how much it is, but put it on my account. Doesn't matter. Put it on my account. Doesn't matter. That's what our Lord would say to us. You come to the cross, he says, ah, you can't pay this back. You can't do it. You can't do it. Your blood, your righteousness, it's not going to work. You need me. Otherwise, you're not going to be saved. You can trust in anything out there except Lord Jesus Christ. We will only get you into it. That's it. Nobody, nobody has fulfilled the law perfectly like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see this. We see this. Um, I'm not saying Paul has fulfilled the law perfectly like Jesus Christ, but Paul's demonstrating the love of Christ. He's demonstrating the heart of the gospel message in a very sincere and real way, taking the debt and wrongdoing of Onesimus, charging it to his own account instead. So as we look at this and how does this apply to our lives, I'm not seeking immediately think about, well, you know, what have people done to me and what have I done to people and what have I done sinning against God and so on. But really, we have been forgiven so much. We really have. We don't even know half the sins we've committed. I mean, probably even more than that. But we don't know that. We don't know how much we've wronged other people. And so we ought to forgive much from other people. Our sins have been charged to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not our own efforts that get us into heaven. It is not what we have done. It's not what we have done. We would have never, ever made it. We don't deserve to be there. The Lord Jesus Christ deserves to be there. And through the grace of God, He's given us this gift, this gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as is the Lord Jesus Christ who forgave us, so must we also do. We are to follow and be examples of Christ. Christians, little Christs. Very little Christ sometimes. Very little Christ. Okay, quickly turn with me um, to Colossians 3, 13, chapter 3, verse 13. I just want to read that verse quickly. I hope that's the right reference because it's not like it, but we'll see. <clears throat> Are you guys all still with me? You awake? All right, well, no, I'm sleep yet. That's no, great. It's often naps a little bit later. All right, look what he says here. I'll give you another moment just to get there. It's Paul writing, it, of course. Forbearing one another. You know what that means? That means patient. It's long suffering. How many times is he going to do this against me? Seven times. And by the way, what uh, some Peter, was, Peter was saying there, uh, that seven times was a, was a very generous uh, estimate in his, in his knowledge of the Lord. It was supposed to only be three times. But he gave him a plus three, plus one. It doubled it and a little plus one for bonus. And the Lord said, no, no much more than that. Much more. And so much more has been forgiven on our account. So we ought to forgive others. Forbearing one another, back to the verse, verse 30, and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You see, he doesn't say, he doesn't say if it's something specific, he says any quarrel. If you have a quarrel, no, forgive it. Forgive that person who has a quarrel against you. Forgive it. Because Christ forgave you. And uh, that that is our good intercessor who intercedes for us. For he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints, the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was not for him, dear friends, we would not, we would not earn our keep in heaven. Uh, it's impossible. Cannot do it. Cannot do it. We needed a Paul. We needed Jesus Christ. And Paul's being a pattern of Christ in this epistle. And then finally, after we looked at a good intercessor, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you're sitting here today, I truly hope and pray that that is the intercessor you are trusting, and you're not relying on your own efforts to mediate your salvation with God. I can tell you now, you're going to lose that battle. You're going to stand before God, and you're going to lose it. You're going to go to the lake of fire. God forbid. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He will put it, whatever you've done, doesn't matter how bad it's been, murderers, and rapists, and all sorts up in heaven, because they took the Lord Jesus' offer of salvation, the free gift of salvation. And that's what we need to remember that. Sometimes maybe we've been a Christian for a long time. We forget how much has been forgiven, how much of Christ or Christ's blood, how much has washed away the things we've done, our unrighteousness. Wow. You can ponder that a long time. And it continues to be. We continue to have forgiveness. He ever liveth to make intercession. 
And so what a, what a wonderful thing to just meditate on that. And then finally, I'm not going to read all these verses, but uh, we're just going to look at a good, the final point I made was a good ending. And I said in the beginning of this, of this message that we all want a good ending. And here in this final, final passage, and I'll just say, uh, having confidence in verse 21, back in five, having confidence in thy obedience, I write unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. And you know, this good ending, I pose you the question to you, the fact that we have this epistle in our Bible, so the scripture, I'm convinced that Philemon did listen, that Philemon did show mercy, he showed forgiveness, and he was forbearing and willing to accept his servant, but now not a servant, a dearly beloved brother of Nessus. He was willing to receive him back. And... Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the entire Matthew 18. But we, the, the purpose of the parable is just to help us realize we, we, are, it's, we are so easy to see the shortcomings of other people. It is so easy to do that. It is so easy. And the more you grow in Christ, the more work you do for the Lord, that zoom lens just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And people, I've heard it said before, and I, I don't want to really not allowed to say this very gently but you know the, the most difficult people to deal with are other christians you know as i grow in my wisdom and knowledge i wish it ought not to be like that but that is the unfortunate report of most of a lot it's sometimes most but a lot of christians and it ought not to be so ought not to be so it's the question i posed to you this morning again a good ending is it going to be a good ending for you? are you busy with a good work do you have a good report in the work that the Lord has called it? Are you trusting the good intercessor to make all things fair and equal, the judgment seat of Christ? You don't have to be right. It's going to get settled in heaven. Maybe you have a doctrinal dispute. Yeah, I hope it's not heresy or something ridiculous. Maybe you have a different opinion of this verse of Scripture. Maybe you want to worship in a specific way and it's not against the Scriptures or whatever. You know? You've got to understand that these things, you can't wage war against your fellow believers because you have a difference of opinion. You can't wage war because, oh man, look at this carpet. How can they choose this color? It doesn't go through. Or whatever, you know. That, those are not things we should be doing. We should be involved in what the Lord would have us to do. And I'm sure I sound like, like a stuck record, but that's such a pivotal part. Such a pivotal part of once we are saved, there's a new purpose. You're a new creature in Christ, born again by the Spirit of God. You have a work that's waiting for you to grab it and move with that thing. It doesn't matter where you are on your journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pick up that shovel or whatever it is that you're doing, and you can start working for the Lord. And remember, the reward is in heaven, and he will give you a hundredfold what you give up for his name. You'll live. And that, that is such a glorious thing to know that no matter what happens down here, we will have a good ending. And that's, that's my final point for this morning. So our last minute before I end this message, I just want to say that Philemon chose to deny himself. I believe that's it. Perhaps you disagree with me. But the fact that this is in the scriptures, I believe Philemon chose to deny himself and practice a Christ-like character. Being Christ-like, saying, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you. I know how much was forgiven for me. I'm not going to be the wicked servant in that parable that said, oh, Lord, you won't believe what I've done. Lord, please forgive me for what I've done. The Lord says, that's fine. If you confess your sins, he will forgive you. He claims you from all unrighteousness. And then somebody wrongs you, maybe drive in front of your lane, or does something to you. Oh, I'm going to get that guy now. And you chase him and you drive him on his tail and you want to take that guy out. And, you know, it's so quick to, 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 to just forget Forget how much mercy and grace we need to live out the Christian life. How to, to I'm sorry, to live Christ like, to walk out our faith, our salvation, fear and trip. And the reason for that is go a little bit to the left, go a little bit to the right ish. You've got to stay on the middle path, practicing these things. We've got to remind ourselves of these things. Sometimes the simple messages is just a, a, a good, refreshing reminder to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do that in the study of his word, fellowship with his people, being involved in a good work, obtaining a good report that our Lord will give us one day. Crowns in heaven, mansions, glories, glorified bodies, 
to a great hope that we have. We have a good ending, safe and secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, I'll say that we cannot do this without the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this morning the message might have moved something in you, might have stirred up something in you, might have reminded you of things you've known for many years, maybe. But I ask that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be with your spirit. And in that being said, before I close, I'd just like to say, if you're sitting here this morning and you don't know if you're saved, if you're not entirely sure who you're trusting and, and what you're trusting, it's very simple. Trust Christ and what he's done for you. He died on the cross for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. And you trust that he died for your sins. He paid your debt in full. Clean record in God's eyes. He washed clean, white as snow. That's what happens when you trust in Jesus Christ. It's very, very easy. Dan asked Adrian yesterday, well, Dan asked Adrian yesterday, when we witnessing, what are you trusting to go to heaven? Unfortunately, he said, oh, that I'm doing my best each and every day. The best each and every day, not going to take you anywhere near heaven, I can assure you. I can assure you. I promise you that. God's word will tell you that. All of sin and fall short to the glory of God. So you must trust Christ to intercede, to take what you owe and to charge that to his account, Lord Jesus' account. And then, my dear friends, you'll have a good ending. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much, Tyler, bringing us the word of God. Um, that's, I think it's so applicable to all of our lives. What I uh, see out of Philemon, when I wondered about this book, and it's a small book written to a friend, kind of one chapter, and but the the message of forgiveness is so big that Paul took this time to write to his fellow worker. And, um, and, and what I see is when this man was busy with the work, work of God um, at a church in his house, he had a good report. But perhaps there was one thing, forgiveness, that kept him back. And, uh, so it's very important that you deal with things like that. And, uh, it's a big lesson for us. I think this year, as we said the other day uh, with Cal when he was visiting us, you know, for our families too. It's, it's the lesson of forgiveness, I think, in 2022 is big for us. So thank you very much for reminding us. And uh, so is there anybody that you need to forgive? Uh, and myself as well. Uh, let's do so heartily, like Christ has forgiven us. Uh, so.